Turn the caliper so you can work on it. There's several different types of brake calipers. This is called the floating type. It has a single piston that pushes against the inner brake pad and slides the caliper towards the inner part of the car, pushing the outer brake pad against the brake disc. Still others have two pistons, a piston on the inside and a piston on the outside that push the pads equally against the brake rotor. I've just removed the brake hose hold-down bolts. That'll help us get the caliper out of the way so we can replace the pads. I'm removing the lower hold-down bolt that keeps the caliper securely against the caliper housing. This one has one on the top and one on the bottom. This particular setup has the brake pads in the caliper housing while still others have the brake pads in the caliper themselves. When we get this off, we'll have a real good view of how the assembly is held together. You've already inspected your brakes and you know that you need to put new pads on. You've gone and you've purchased new pads. Some pads will come with an anti-squeal compound. Some will come with anti-squeal shims. If they don't come with the anti-squeal shims and you find anti-squeal shims when you take yours off, reuse your old ones. Here we've removed the caliper from the housing. I'm going to support it with a utility cord so that the caliper itself doesn't hang from the brake hose. This is something we don't want to put any extra stress on. Remove the pads. At this point you can inspect the inner side of the brake rotor for any gouging. This is a normally worn pad. This is the brake wear indicator, the tuning fork type. This is a badly worn brake pad. This pad was making an awful grinding sound, and it didn't start yesterday. This pad needed to be replaced and the rotors. That's why we inspect them before they get to that point. This is a new brake pad, and the anti-squeal compound and the anti-squeal shims but a generous amount of the anti-squeal compound on it, but not so much that it squeezes out from around the sides of the shims. Keep in mind that you want to put the inner pad back on the inside and the outer pad back on the outside. And it's a big help to keep the other side of the car assembled so you've got something to look at in case you have a question. Brake squeal generally comes from the piston pushing on the backing plate of the brake pad, not the brake pad pushing on the rotor. Repeat the anti-squeal compound on the outer pad and replace the shim. If your new pad kit didn't come with new shims and you took shims off, go ahead and reuse them. Next, we're going to have to depress the piston in the caliper. We'll have to get the piston back to its fullest extent in order to fit the caliper back over the new, wider brake pads. Take off the dust cap on the bleeder. Here, I'm going to use channel locks to push the piston back into the caliper. You want to open the bleeder nipple in order to let the fluid out of the caliper while you depress the piston. Don't just force the piston back into the caliper because you'll push the fluid into the system and cause a spongy pedal. Catch the brake fluid in a pan. Don't just let it go out onto the ground. Once the piston is as far back in the caliper as it will go, close the bleeder. Now we'll fit the caliper over the new brake pads and secure it 
to the caliper housing. Start the upper and lower bolts, and at this point, make certain that the caliper is positioned correctly. Now, if you get in here and see that there's more work to be done, or more work than you want to do, at least you'll know the true condition of your brakes, and you'll be able to get an accurate estimate from a mechanic willing to do the job. Tools get slippery sometimes. You might need to hold on to them with something more than your greasy fingers. And have a good hand cleaner ready for when the job's over. Tighten the upper and lower housing bolts so they're secure. At this point, tighten the bleeder nipple. Replace the dust cap so dirt doesn't get into the bleeder. I had to remove the brake hose hold down bolts, and I'll have to put those back in also. Don't forget, at this point, you're about halfway done. You've got the other side of the car to do yet. Remember, when you're working with the brake solvent, the aerosol brake solvent, we'll use it in a well-ventilated area. Avoid prolonged contact with the brake fluid on your skin. If you happen to get brake fluid on any of the paint of your car, wipe it off immediately. Now let's replace the road wheel. Put all the lug nuts on and snug them up. I'm going to be using a pneumatic wrench to do it, but I'm only going to snug the nuts up. If you're using a cross type wrench or a lug wrench, Snug them up until the car is securely on the ground and then tighten them. If you're using the hand tools, tighten them as tight as you can get them, but remember, you or someone else will take them off again. This is an alloy wheel on a disc brake rotor. I'm going to use a torque wrench to tighten the lug nuts on this wheel. This is a click type torque wrench and I'm going to set it to 85 foot-pounds per square inch. And I'll tighten the lug nuts in a cross pattern, ensuring equal pressure on each of the four lug nuts. This equal pressure will help prevent any warping of the rotor or the wheel. This next step is very important. Pump the brake pedal. Don't even start the car, get in it and pump the pedal. You have to push the piston and the pads back out against the rotor. Pump the pedal. Next we have to check the fluid level in the brake master cylinder. Locate the reservoir and remove the top. If the fluid level is up to the maximum line, generally indicated on the outside of the canister, you're fine. If it's below the line, top it up with the appropriate brake fluid. As you can see, disc brake pad replacement isn't that tough, if you remember these important points.